Well, hello everybody. We are at the turn of the 20th century into the 20th century. And by now, Russia is very much part of the international community. And we saw that the 19th century produced gorgeous art, very much on uh, an international scale. It produced spectacular music, it produced um, a great literature, also science. So Russia is fully aware now of what, the, what is happening. And what is happening is a great technological progress. It began back in the 17th century in England, the Industrial Revolution, then it spilled into Europe, and it is now reaching Russia, and Russia is very aware of it. Now, it just so happens that um, throughout history, fantasy and imagination always underscored um, human uh, thought. In fact, the 20th century, that would become the most rational of all from the scientific point of view will uh, become the most irrational from uh, the um, psychological point of view and from the inner processes of uh, human psyche. Uh, it will also become the, the century of uh, absolutely horrific totalitarianism, mass extinction, um, concentration camps, death camps. All of that will also be part of the 20th century with the A-bomb as um, its singular achievement. And uh, so there seems to be a pattern. The more rational the external appearances, the more irrational um, the human emotional processes become. And uh, here's just a short list of technological achievements that, that, uh, that had been accomplished by the turn of the 20th century. And this is not even including a motor car or an airplane. Uh, but radioactivity was, um, was discovered, a model of an atom was built, theory of special relativity was discovered, third law of thermodynamics, um, uh, chemotherapy, industrial production of ammonia, atomic nucleus, all of this had been discovered and more. And uh, frankly, art was really poorly equipped to deal with this kind of uh, uh, technological brilliance and technological uh, uh, stepping forward. Even when photography was discovered in the 19th century and was utilized by the artist, but still there was a great fear that uh, the art was now unnecessary because photography will, will do everything that uh, art did before. The Impressionism and then Expressionism and all the other isms that escaped into color, into emotion, uh, into human angst uh, where photography at that point couldn't, uh, couldn't follow. And therefore, uh, there appeared this um, Elena Blavatsky, uh, who was a spiritualist of sorts. Uh, she came up with this phenomenon called Theosophy, which was a blend of various mystical thought processes uh, that uh, Western Europe had played with, uh, had experimented with for quite a while. And um, one of the wide uh, range of loosely related ideas and movements that had developed within the Western society. Um, in Europe, during the Age of Enlightenment, during the 18th century, these uh, traditions were characterized either as spiritualism or magic, the occult, and uh, used uh, interchangeably. In her case, she relied very heavily on Hindu mysticism and, according to her, traveled uh, to India and uh, uh, conversed with the Magi, as she would call them. She claimed that the doctrines were not her own invention but had been received from a brotherhood of uh, these secret spiritual Magi, whom uh, she referred to as, uh, as masters. And she was, uh, she was very influential and developed the whole school with followers. She was Russian. Uh, her name was Elena Blavatskaya, or she came to be known as Madame Blavatsky. And at the turn of the century, the whole uh, uh, involvement with the occult and with the spiritual became an obsession. Uh, so many people veritably uh, converted to it. And among them, uh, among writers, uh, Yeats, uh, William Butler Yeats and Lewis Carroll. Here we have Arthur Conan Doyle, Ian Forrester, James Joyce, D.H. Lawrence, T.S. Eliot, I mean very, very significant names, psychologists, well, Jung, of course, 
And then with the artists, well, we saw Nikolai Relik, uh, but also Piet Modrian and Gauguin, Paul Klee, uh, the politicians, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, who was a student of law in London uh, when he encountered Madame Blavatsky. She helped him reclaim his uh, birthright, for which he was um, extraordinarily grateful. So as you can see, uh, a number of, and this is just a very short list, this is really the tip of the iceberg who were influenced by her. Here is Nikolai Redik. We talked about him in the last lecture and he definitely, as you remember, traveled widely in India, died in India, was very much taken by uh, the Hindu mysticism and by local religions uh, and was uh, definitely also a convert to Madame Blavatska. Um, but the man who in who truly will become pretty much the founder of abstract art. Um, his name is Vasily Kandinsky. Uh, here he is. He is a Russian, genuinely credited as one of the pioneers. Um, he was born in Moscow. He was actually trained originally in um, economics and law. He was even offered uh, a chair in one of the Russian universities. So he came to art rather late, at around uh, when he was about 30. And, um, and at first, uh, he abhorred the whole idea of uh, abstraction. He felt that was just too trivial, just uh, to paint with color without uh, any meaning behind them was too superficial and as such not worthy of true art. And his works, um, in fact, present certain problems because um, he developed an almost missionary zeal to uh, uh, Theosophy. Uh, uh, Blavatsky was dead by that time, but others uh, picked up her banner. And Kandinsky uh, converted uh, hook, uh, line, and sinker to Theosophy. Um, he felt that the physical world was, was losing its importance and should be seen as a stumbling block. Uh, so he felt ultimately that his art was to help humanity to overcome uh, this stumbling block. And Blavatska herself, one of her tenets was that the future, future belong very much to technology and art will have um, no role to play in it. Um, she, belie she believed in a millenarian uh, principle of sorts because, well, the 20th century was afoot and whether one considers the 20th century as the end of the millennium or the beginning of the next millennium, one felt these um, millenarian inklings very much in one's soul. And one can also think of, um, of Christianity. Christian obsession with revelation and with the millenarian apocalypse. One way or another, this world uh, will end and the next world will begin. And so many so many of these secular religions or spiritual religions, if you will, um, prophesied uh, the end of this world and uh, the beginning of uh, the next world. Uh, and uh, so Madame Blavatsky very much appealed to the artist and uh, to the writers to guide men through, uh, um, through this morass, to show them the light. And for a Russian such as Kandinsky, it really wasn't so difficult because Russia had a millenarian tradition of um, abstraction and stylization in its icons. It was very much, it was very used to this sort of thinking. And um, so the image of an icon in itself had an elevated spiritual meaning and uh, so his thinking was steeped in it. Um, Born in Moscow, as I said, he um, at some point he went to Germany. He went to Munich School of Art and uh, lived in the south of Germany, painted there, and then uh, being in love with Theosophy, he began to write about his art, about the spiritualism of art, uh, about the inner necessity of art, this sort of thing. Um, he was one of the founders uh, of a group called Blau Rider, the uh, uh, the Blue Rider, uh, which um, encompassed a number of German artists as well, uh, together with the Russian artists. And that's the sort of thing that uh, they believed in, the, uh, the necessity of art to show the light. 
away from materialism because as they saw the technological progress they saw more and more of uh, materialism around them and human preoccupation with material values and they felt that that was just anathema and anathema that was killing the spiritual richness of a human soul and they must show the way out of it. Uh, in this particular case, uh, well, form is pretty much dissolved. Um, he uses a lot of blue because blue to Kandinsky allegorized spirituality. And the deeper the blue, the darker the blue, the more spiritual it, he meant it to be. With time, as we will see, uh, he, he loved the idea of writers, he loved the idea of Russian folk tales, he loved the idea of, um, uh, of color patches. He was quite nearsighted, so anything that uh, he saw, anything distant, he saw as uh, color uh, patches without contours. These writers will uh, ultimately, in his art, become the writers, the four writers of the apocalypse, the, uh, the harbingers. Of the uh, of the next um, of the next millennium, we don't know whether the group was called after this this particular painting. The group was formed around 1911 and existed till 1914, when the first war uh, began. At which point he had to go back to Russia because that's the passport he had, and a number of Russians had to go back, and um, uh, some some German uh, great German artists actually will die in uh, the First World War. Kandinsky ultimately will come back after the war, he will go back to Germany, he'll settle in Germany and then uh, finally will find himself in Paris and that's where he will die because after the R Russian Revolution, as we saw in the last lecture, many people uh, well, had to leave Russia. Uh, while he lived in Germany before the First World War, uh, he lived in the area of uh, Munich and uh, the area of Murnau, which is near uh, Munich and sort of on the border, on the Austrian border. And um, his art there, as I said, he was very nearsighted, so you see these patches, very bright patches of, um, uh, of color, and he clearly feels uh, happy, because these paintings are happy, and they are somewhat folksy. It's, we'll, we'll be looking at Chagall soon enough, uh, and obviously they're quite different from Chagall, but that whole feeling of a Slavic uh, uh, countryside is very much there. And that's what we see here. Uh, train and castle. Uh, train, he just sees it as one uh, black patch going through the countryside, cutting through the countryside. And the castle here, well, looks more like a house again, rather than a castle. Uh, trains were no longer uh, a new phenomenon in Europe because back in the 19th century when they were new everybody was painting them but still they provided means for transportation they were the most efficient way of communication and uh, as a result uh, they still were painted because one still could not run away from technology one did uh, uh, include technology in one's art as you see Kandinsky uh, do here um, despite the fact that he himself uh, warned against um, pure abstraction because, uh, as I said, he was, uh, he feared its triviality and warned uh, in his writing against uh, pure abstraction becoming simply decorative and decorative something that he tried to run away from. Uh, for him, this was uh, something of inner necessity, as it says here. Uh, his creation of abstract work followed a long period of development, which period uh, included this uh, um, conversion to Madame Blavatsky's uh, theosophy. Uh, he also had this rather interesting ability, at least he claimed he did, that he could, uh, he could see music and hear colors. Uh, he also presumably had uh, a photographic memory for whatever he saw and could reproduce it after, of course, it was translated in his mind into the sounds of color. And uh, this transformation from one sensation to another, from hearing to feeling uh, to touching, all of that was very much of Kandinsky's art and he wanted to convey it uh, to his viewers 
as means to overcome the uh, material environment. He wished to describe um, the spiritual states, so to speak, the empathy of the soul, the depth of feeling, all of that uh, he felt came with, um, with his pictures. In the end, as you can imagine, um, this became a bit of a muddle because uh, there's absolutely no guarantee that, say, some blue background or some patch of purple represents the same to the observer as it did to Kandinsky. So his attempt at creating this universal uh, grammar of uh, color meant a lot to him, but doesn't necessarily mean much to, uh, to the observer. Uh, here is another uh, painting that's called Small Pleasures, and this really is sort of apocalyptic in a way. What he describes here are, well, there's a boat, you see, there's a boat with the three oars that we see, then presumably uh, there's a couple walking around at the foot of one hill, there's a second hill uh, right there, there seems to be a rider on a horse, perhaps three horses um, galloping together, and uh, it seems that this is the vision of uh, the Apocalypse. This is St. John's uh, Revelation, where the small pleasures, as uh, he calls them, will end and uh, the world will change on the cosmic scale and one must be prepared for it. And so as a result, uh, although his paintings can appear quite elliptical, and they are frankly elliptical, uh, because they made a lot of sense to himself, but not necessarily a lot of sense to others. However, they are fascinating, at least from the historical perspective, because uh, uh, in order to understand them, one must really uh, uh, submerge oneself in the world of the um, intellectual uh, elite of the time, of uh, how they felt, what they felt, this was the period of uh, uprisings, there was uh, the first Russian Revolution in uh, 1905. The technological progress was, of course, uh, tremendous, and the artist had to find his, her place in this very, very uh, changing universe. Meanwhile, in France, uh, also in the early uh, 20th century, uh, Matisse had uh, come up with uh, a movement that was called Fauvism, and uh, essentially that movement embraced the uh, brightness of color. It was very happy, the whole idea of that movement was happy. Not only the brightness of color, but also irregularity of color and the inconstancy of color. And uh, the Impressionists had already shown the world that uh, uh, color is not permanent, that a woman in a white dress uh, going through the field, uh, through the field of poppies, for instance, the white dress will turn red. Or if she goes through a field of green grass, it will turn green. So there is no constancy to color, and Matisse embraced it and introduced a fauvism, which embraced all this changeability of color. Also, at about the same time, uh, Picasso will come up with his proto-cubism with the Demoiselle de Vignon. Uh, where there'll be inconstancy of everything, inconstancy of color, inconstancy of, of form, of position, uh, all the rules were being broken. Uh, the atom was um, being broken up, uh, the plane went up and the world appeared uh, made up of little squares from up high and uh, the artist felt that, uh, the artists felt that they must embrace uh, these new developments and, uh, and act accordingly. In Italy, at the same time, is happening the so-called Futurism, when the Futurist movement decided that everything that happened before must be destroyed altogether in, um, in favor of uh, future development and future technological development. In this case, they embraced technology. But before they embraced technology, everything else has to be smashed two pieces. And what we see in futuristic uh, paintings is this splitting of forms, blowing everything up. Uh, so all these changes are happening and uh, a number of Russian painters are very much influenced by these changes. Not the ones from the uh, world of art that we were talking about last time. In fact, they disdained it. They did not accept it at all. But the, their contemporaries, other artists, other Russian artists did. So between Cubism and Fauvism and Futurism, those three movements made a great impression on a number of uh, Russian artists, among whom Marc Chagall is certainly not the last. 
had an extremely fortunate life. He lived almost until a hundred. He was born in a small town of Vitebsk to a relatively poor family, but apparently not poor enough so that they couldn't send him to Moscow to, to study. He then found himself in Germany, he found himself in Paris, um, but uh, he is a perfect case where you can take a boy out of a small town, but you can never take a small town out of the boy, because throughout his entire long, long, long life, he will always paint uh, the images of, um, of his childhood. Uh, the art critic Robert Hughes uh, referred to Chagall as the quintessential Jewish artist of the 20th century, because he lived in a Jewish pale and think Fiddler on the Roof. And that's pretty much what he painted, and that's pretty much what was in his mind. Uh, and uh, he'll become extremely successful. Despite being Jewish, he will live through the First World War. He will not be conscripted in the army. He will marry his beloved Bella. He will then go to Paris, have a very successful career in Paris before the Second World War. He will emigrate to America, live peacefully in America, escape uh, the horrible dangers um, that uh, the Jews faced uh, in Europe after the war was over. He was quickly back in France uh, and lived in the south of France for the rest of his life, for the rest of his very, very long life. So a very fortunate man with a very fortunate uh, life. Some of his early paintings, um, here is one fiddler, here is uh, a green uh, violinist, but basically it's uh, the same idea of a fiddler. Again, fiddler on the roof. Uh, the colors are completely arbitrary, just as Matisse prescribed them to be. The forms are broken, just as Picasso prescribed them to be. Everything is open. Pretty much anybody can do anything they want. And uh, that's how Chagall uh, saw uh, saw his memories, and that's how Chagall saw his uh, childhood. And uh, he deeply resented anybody's attempt to analyze his paintings and to try to make something out of them, something deep and profound. He felt that there was none of it there. I mean, I didn't know what I was painting. I just was painting something that uh, appealed to me, something that I liked, the, shape I li the shapes I liked, the colors I liked, the memories I had or dreamed up. And uh, that was it. He found his niche, uh, and he stuck to that niche for the rest of his life. And that niche proved to be extremely successful. Um, here is uh, a very famous village of um, I and uh, the village. It's uh, cubist in construction. It's fauvist in its uh, coloring. It does contain all these uh, dreamlike visions. There is. Uh, uh, a woman uh, upside down, a milkmaid perhaps, a peasant uh, walking to the field. Uh, there's a fruit tree here, uh, a face of a man which is green, but then Matisse painted his own wife uh, in all sorts of colors, and a horse, a horse or a cow, the cow is being milked. Frenetic, fa fanciful style, uh, credited to his um, uh, childhood, uh, Jensen called it the Cubist fairy tale. And yes, uh, obviously when he was growing up he heard all sorts of fairy tales between the, and the Jewish tales and the Russian tales. And uh, when you think of uh, Fiddler on the Roof, if you saw it, it's, it's a brilliant musical. These images spring to life. Um, the, uh, a great Russian Jewish writer by the name of Babel wrote about that sort of life and uh, needless to say Chagall was very familiar with it as well. Um, a delightful uh, piece that I personally love very much is uh, uh, his image of um, himself and uh, and his wife Bella. And later on, Bella in her memoirs uh, that she wrote uh, thirty plus years after their first meeting wrote that uh, with great difficulty she found out uh, when his birthday was, and she brought flowers and. Uh, uh, she came uh, with, with the Russian shawl and he was so delighted. He hung the shawls everywhere and he immediately began to paint. And he came up with uh, this image. You see, it's called the birthday, 1915. Uh, he was now in Russia. The First World War began on, uh, in 1914, so he had to go back to Russia. This image uh, actually directly feeds into a 15th century image 
over Van Eyck, uh, the Arnolfini portrait that really became extremely famous, this piece, and everybody who studied art knew about this piece, and it shows a uh, very wealthy bourgeois couple. They're actually both Italians, but they are rep he is the representative of, of an Italian bank in, uh, in the north, in the Low Countries. He is marrying also an Italian uh, girl who was born in Paris of Italian parents. And uh, there's a bed that she appears to be already pregnant. Uh, there, are, there is fruit on the windowsill that signify uh, fertility, that uh, signify happiness. The dog, uh, again, the emblem, the allegory of fidelity. They're sort of standing on sacred ground. Therefore, they're unshod, the, uh, the shoes are left uh, on the side. And so what Chagall does, he reinterprets the Arnolfini wedding in his own terms. There's the bed, and here's the windowsill. Here's another one, and instead of the fruit, we have flowers, and Chagall is so happy, and Belle is so happy, they're flying. They will be called the flying uh, lovers of Vitebs. And here are the two paintings together. Uh, here's the bed, and there's the window instead of uh, a looking glass. Here, Chagall has another window, and as uh, uh, there are very rich uh, curtains and uh, fabrics in the Arnolfini wedding, Chagall also populates his painting with richly decorated fabrics as the shawls. This one was painted in the middle of the, uh, the early part of the 15th century, and this is the early part of um, the 20th, so 500 years later. He loved living in Paris, and here is his view through the window in Paris. The Eiffel Tower appears in very many uh, paintings over the time. Uh, it was built uh, by 1889 for the World Fair as uh, an allegory of the greatest achievement, the greatest technological achievement. And that's how it was seen by everyone, essentially. It was supposed to be taken down after the fair, but it stayed. And uh, as it stayed, it became a symbol of Paris. And uh, one sees it in a number of paintings and in a number of paintings by Chagall. This is a double-faced allegory, perhaps, of the uh, pagan god Janus, uh, who looks towards the next year, January, and also back to the preceding year, or perhaps it's Chagall who loves his uh, Paris, loves living in Paris, at the same time missing his Russia, missing his Vitebsk, very possible. Uh, a human-headed cat, some flowers, uh, he, uh, there is a parachutist, uh, and uh, there was the first jump with the parachute around th that time. Often bright lights were uh, placed onto the Eiffel Tower, and clearly Chagall loved that as well. I mean, his paintings are full of um, light, are full of happiness, full of cheeriness. And to think that here's the man who lived through two absolutely horrendous wars, and it really didn't reflect in his art practically at all. Uh, he just lived this happy-go-lucky life uh, in wealth and fame and surrounded by people who loved him. Uh, free to experiment all he wished, and came up with these, um, well, uh, uh, happy-go-lucky paintings, uh, as we see it here. Uh, the two of them, just as they were flying in the, um, in the picture of the birthday, uh, he proceeded to do a whole series of these uh, flying lovers in Vichypsk, and that's what they're called. They're called Flying Lovers. Uh, he is in Russia at this point. The war is still very much happening. The Russian Revolution is happening at this point, uh, the October Revolution of 1917. But uh, for Chagall, everything is green, pink, lovely, uh, flying, happy. And here he is, and his beloved Bella, uh, and uh, with, uh, with a Russian picnic right here that's taking place on a, on a red a Russian shawl, again, we see a lot of red. It's all conceived in the cubo slash uh, fauvistic uh, terms. Irregular color, irregular form, irregular shape, um, all of it there, and a lovely result. Here's another one of the uh, flying lovers, both of them are now flying. Over their town, there's a Russian church, there is a Russian uh, log cabins, uh, the um, wooden fences that surround private properties or private homes, 
all of it is there. Bella is doing her gardening, which she clearly liked to do, and she is larger than life. She rises above the village, above the fields, above everything. She is the most important thing that God had ever created for him. There's the little village, and perhaps that Chagall with the little child. Uh, we don't know. The most important thing is Bella, and that's how he saw her. So much was the world enamored with Chagall at the time. He became, well, a fad, uh, so to speak, that uh, the Paris Opera made a decision which, exclusively my opinion, was um, a mistake because the Paris Opera that was built in the um, uh, 19th century, later 19th century, uh, part of the Belle Epoque, and uh, it's just a palace of luxury. Uh, of uh, very much uh, neo-Renaissance, neo-Baroque uh, luxury as conceived by the new wealthy class who wants to show their wealth, who wants to throw their money around. And uh, at the time it was constructed, it was considered to be in that taste. Today it's one of the most spectacular buildings um, in the world because not that many of them are left. And uh, as belongs to buildings like this, it's full of gilding, it's full of beautiful neoclassical sculpture, it is full of cupids flying in the ceilings, um, this sort of paintings. And, uh, but the Paris Opera decided to hire Chagall to change the painting in their main uh, hall. Here at the Grand Escalier you still see the feasts of the gods, the allegories of beauty, all sorts of allegories that uh, were so common in the 19th century. But then the committee decided to change the main ceiling and uh, they asked Chagall to, uh, to supply it. And to be honest, uh, perhaps it's difficult to tell in a slide, uh, but to be honest, when one walks in and looks up at the ceiling, that's not what one expects in a building like this. If anything, it appears illogical and uh, somewhat scratchy. Uh, it just doesn't belong in the whole scheme, uh, the Renaissance scheme, for instance, where everything has to flow together. Uh, architecture, sculpture, painting, the entire interior design was one uh, piece of art. Uh, here they destroyed it, but we do have the Chagall ceiling. Kazimir Malevich, uh, who will never emigrate, who will stay in Russia, uh, he began with uh, involving himself with all these uh, new uh, influences from the West, and this particular direction will be called Cuba Futurism, and that, that was a Russian direction, where Russians combined Cubism of, uh, of France and Futurism of Italy. And the whole idea of futurism was to convey movement, to convey this extraordinarily fast movement forward into the future. That's what futurism tried to convey. And cubism, of course, broke up images into plain forms. And here he is painting the knife grinder, the principle of glittering. Uh, you can just uh, you can just discern. There is a man. Here's this head, his arms. His uh, mechanism, uh, uh, and there are the knives. And at that time, one often saw knife grinders just walking through the streets of certainly Russian streets, but uh, but I think in Europe in general because everybody needed their knives uh, sharpened. And there were these um, knife sharpeners, knife grinders, who walked around and offered their services. And a lot of uh, housewives would come out of their kitchens with their knives and have their knives sharpened. Uh, clearly Malevich was uh, fascinated by the whole idea, the constant movement of the, uh, of the knife and the constant movement of the grinding uh, wheel and that's what uh, he is painting here. Uh, it's, it's the principle of glittering. That's what he's trying to convey and he's using uh, the broken up cubistic shapes and also the continuous movement to convey that. He also, however, just as Kandinsky did, embraced the uh, neo russicism so to speak, and uh, he was charmed by uh, the Russian countryside and the Russian fairy tales. And as you see here, the sort of the cubic Slavic revival, one sees uh, these very cubic shapes of uh, perhaps a man and a woman with their buckets of water because there's no inside plumbing, so one has to go to the well for their water. This takes place presumably in the winter because the white patches appear to be those of snow and that's how Malevich saw it. 
it is not entirely different from a French uh, painter by the name of uh, Leger, who depicted his experiences of the war uh, in similar terms. And then still another uh, ism that's called rayonism, and uh, that was uh, um, promulgated uh, by, uh, by Mikhail Larionov and his wife uh, or partner, Natalia Goncharova. They, uh, um, they will marry towards the end of their lives, but otherwise they just live together. And they were both artists. Uh, they met at the uh, Art Academy in Moscow. Goncharova was actually the great-granddaughter of Alexander Pushkin. Uh, so, well, they met in the Art Academy and uh, they just became a couple. They immigrated together and lived their entire life, essentially, in, um, in Paris. So, Lirionov came up with the so-called, uh, uh, well, rayism. Uh, or luchism in Russian from the word uh, luch. Luch means ray, and that's where this comes from. Uh, it's kind of a style of abstract art developed by, um, by Larionov. How he came upon it? Well, again, through cubism and through futurism. He discovered Joseph Mallard uh, William Turner, who was uh, a seascape uh, painter in 19th century England, uh, loved uh, portraying water and was very brilliant at it. Uh, Larionov uh, very much embraced the idea and uh, wanted to present it in modern terms, portraying water or glass, perhaps, and that was his way of doing it. Um, his eventual method, uh, based on uh, a very unclear theory of invisible rays, uh, not unlike the futuristic lines of force. Well, as I said, the combination of cubism and futurism, I mean, none of that was... Uh, was very clear, and the theories and manifestos uh, were printed out and uh, invented just about uh, every week. There was a new manifesto, uh, a new theory, a new ism. And uh, to understand this art, to appreciate this art, one really has to appreciate the time these people lived in. Whether this art truly is transcendental and uh, will hold its value 200 years from now, well, that too is unclear because I doubt that 200 years from now the uh, society will understand the spiritual drive that uh, guided these men at the time and that justified for them or drove them again uh, to produce these uh, sort of canvases. But certainly in their mind they were very much justified. Uh, Natalia Gonchurova, who was um, Lirionov's wife, as I said, she often painted these folk images uh, which allowed her the use of beautiful bright colors. She also painted something like this, it's called the laundry, and the words here, they are in Russian, pratichne means uh, the laundry, the laundromat, and uh, this is half a word, perhaps uh, rabota. She divides the painting, well, she's living with Larry Wallace, so she divides the painting into the masculine and the feminine side. And here we see men's shirts with cufflinks and uh, with the pleated front. Uh, on the other side are female blouses. Uh, here's technology again, just as Kandinsky did not escape technology and portrayed the train. Here Goncharova is showing us the steam iron right here that allowed this kind of work to go forth. Uh, very, very much uh, cubist work with broken shapes and irregular lettering. That already comes uh, more from, uh, not so much from analytic cubism as from synthetic cubism, but Picasso was developing all these isms uh, pretty much at the same time. Still another uh, Russian Jewish artist by the name of Kaim Sutin was very influenced by Modigliani. He became good friends with Modigliani, and Modigliani is painting his portrait here. Uh, there's a little resemblance to my eye, but this is a photograph of Soutine. He embraced not so much cubism or futurism as expressionism. And in this he admired Rembrandt and did a number of uh, copies of Rembrandt's slaughtered ox. This is Soutine, for which he actually brought into his very poor little den uh, a number of corpses, of ox's corpses, that proceeded to rot. and. Um, and the neighbors complained, but he uh, kept insisting that all of this is in the name of art. This is what he really is known for, for these sides of beef where he throws into our faces the inside of a creature 
previously alive and now dead. Unlike Chagall, he was not successful, nor was he wealthy. He struggled all his life, and he certainly didn't have money to run away to America before the Second World War. He had to escape Paris and hide in the woods uh, because he was Jewish. Uh, he ultimately he will die, not in the concentration camp. He just died of, um, of all of these trials and of poor health. Meanwhile, these are the sort of portraits uh, he did. This is a self portrait. He looked more at the likes of uh, Georges Rouault, who was uh, uh, a contemporary uh, painter, and this is the head of a tragic clown, also a much more expressionistic work than it is a cubist work. And that's what Soutine is looking at. Here are the Soutine's portraits. Here is the actual face. There he is, he is portrayed by Modigliani. Modigliani is really painting uh, Modigliani more than Soutine. And or himself, and uh, and here Soutine by Soutine. This is his uh, self-portrait, and perhaps the self-portrait conveyed himself and uh, and his tragic soul far more than uh, Modigliani did. Uh, he also clearly loved Toulouse-Lautrec because these very quick sketches with thick brush and uh, rapid movement are delightful and uh, are pictures of people in cafes of. Uh, having a good time, drinking their coffee, wine, uh, a delightful young girl uh, seemingly flirting with someone. So these quick sketches are very wonderful. He was lucky to find a patron at one point and this patron did uh, uh, take him traveling. He took him south and there Soutine was able to do some landscapes. He also, as you can see, admired Van Gogh and uh, took Van Gogh and Van Gogh's images and exaggerated them in, uh, in his own style, both in a cityscape and in a still life. And in Soutine's interpretation, the still life is not still at all. It's uh, very dynamic. A butcher boy where he conveys the uh, job of the boy, uh, the job in which he assists uh, with a lot of blood. He conveys blood by the background color. And now we go back to Russia uh, because we had looked at the artists who, um, who left Russia and who continued to live in um, France actually for the rest of their lives, but those who stayed in Russia had to adjust. And at first the whole idea of the October Revolution was fascinating because it's kind of uh, furnished the avant-garde artists, Russian artists, with its social metaphor, so to speak, because uh, there was the future, there was the millenarian fantasy, and there had to be the art of the future. And uh, that art of the future was related directly to the millenarianism of Marxism, Leninism. Everything material had to be uh, done away with. Everything possessable uh, was... Uh, uh, had to be eliminated. Uh, therefore, there couldn't be uh, any personal art, any, any human art, any art that actually relates to a regular human bourgeois, if you will, level to us. Uh, so art had to go abstract because that's the only art that is completely disengaged from human emotions, it's disengaged from human experience, it's disengaged from human feelings, and that is abstract art. Hence, suprematism. Russian art movement which focused on basic geometric forms uh, um, and conveyed uh, the pure artistic uh, feeling. It was uh, a final disengagement of painting from anything that deals with everyday uh, human emotion. It had to go away from it because that was not what the future was about. The future was about the absence of state, the absence of material possessions, the absence of jealousy, the absence of anger, paradise. The future was paradise on earth. Well, needless to say, that future never arrived. Instead of that, what they got, and many artists perished uh, in what will happen. Uh, as I had mentioned before, uh, horrendous concentration camps. The entire Soviet Union, as I had mentioned before, was built on slavery. Nothing new in Russian history, as uh, we had seen. So thus, suprematism. That's what it was called. And it's the same Kazimir Malevich who did the knife grinder, 
uh, now very much embrace this euphoria that lasted between uh, 1917 from the October Revolution to about 1923, um, six years, about until Stalin uh, took the reins of uh, power into his own hands and uh, smothered it all entirely. And in fact, a number of these artists, the so-called avant-garde artists, were proclaimed as the enemies of the people, just as Hitler later on will proclaim that art, degenerate art, and a number of them, whether artists or writers or poets, will end up and will die in concentration camps. Uh, meanwhile, that euphoria will last for about six years, uh, and then it will stop. Uh, here is uh, Kazimir Malevich, who came up with the so-called uh, Black Square. He painted four versions of the Black Square because one wasn't enough. It began its life as a stage curtain, as the design for a stage curtain uh, in the futurist opera Victory Over the Sun. Here it is, and here is a black rectangle, here is a black square, and then he decided to eliminate everything else and just to keep the black square. And then the epitome of this constructivist escape from the role of depiction was uh, the white on white. And here you have it. And from here the road was open to similar depictions and we'll see it revived again in America in the 50s with color field paintings of uh, Barnett Newman, for instance. Uh, Malevich also tried to construct uh, appropriate uh, architecture for the new age. So here, for instance, somewhat naive, but he's imagined a house for a pilot. So obviously a house for a pilot must look like uh, a plane. Needless to say, it was never built. Uh, because, well, the Soviet Union didn't have any resources for building, but uh, one can just imagine what a plumber's house would look like. Well, away from that, um, one of the 20th century most influential movements, uh, it amounted to nothing less than an attack on art, constructivism. It just, just as futurism wanted to destroy everything that came before, now constructivism also wanted to destroy art. In 1922, one Russian artist named uh, Gunn penned a manifesto where he wrote, We declare uncompromising war on art. The Russian Revolution had taken place five years earlier. The country was in the process of destroying the past. Now it would revolutionize Russia's cultural life too and put art to work in the service of a new communist um, society. Enter Vladimir Tatlin, who also never left Russia, who stayed in Russia. And uh, Vladimir Tatlin came up with, uh, well, the next stage of suprematism, and that is constructivism, or part of suprematism. And constructivists believed that art had no place in the artist studio, that art had no place in the museum, for that matter, that art, uh, that art was around us. Anything we look at is art. In a way, um, Picasso's found art was uh, not far removed uh, from that. Uh, art should reflect the modern industrial world. And it has to be formulated in factories and in laboratories. Uh, it has to be an active agent of the communist revolution. And um, together, the artists would seek to find a communist expression of material construction. Hence. Here you have his sort of painterly relief where he just conveys uh, found materials uh, essentially that were, that are put together as if they are lying in the garbage can in anybody's backyard. So, but that was reality. Tatlin essentially took the idea of realists from a hundred years earlier the realists who propagated for social change and who wished to draw only what they saw, the people they saw, the workers uh, who labored in the, um, in the factories, and paint that rather than, uh, say, the allegories of uh, Greek myths. But Tatlin took that a lot further. And uh, this is something also that constructivists would do, emphasize building and science rather than artistic expression. And so their goals went far beyond the realm of art as we know it. They wanted, they sought to influence, and they did influence, architecture, design, fashion, 
all mass-produced objects. They did. They influenced it tremendously. Uh, so in place of painterly concerns with composition, uh, the constructivists were interested well, in construction rather than composition. Uh, engineering became art for them. Not painting, not sculpture, engineering. Here he did these uh, corner reliefs of um, unclear purpose. Today it looks like a, a TV stuck in the corner, but it's interesting that it's in the corner because Russian icons, remember, were always in the corner. That magical corner in, in every izba, in every Russian home. Uh, here now in the corner sat this construction as the harbinger of uh, future inventions. Uh, granted, uh, it's about, about that time Pablo Picasso came up with this guitar and uh, so sculpture was no longer a surface, whatever surface it is, whether polished, as in the case with the Renaissance uh, sculptors, or uneven, as uh, in the case of someone like Auguste Rodin, the French sculptor. Now sculpture was made of planes, and uh, the inner world between those planes was just as important as the surface of the planes. So the light penetrating between the planes became the negative space, the negative space versus positive space, I, I talked about it um, earlier, uh, now became overemphasized. And that's what Tatlin is doing here as well. Uh, he is most remembered for the so-called Tatlin's Tower that uh, he designed in 1920. It was never built. It was uh, to be built from modern industrial materials, such as iron, glass, steel. Uh, it had a form of sort of the twin helixes, like the DNA, which went up to 1,313 feet in height, which was 300 feet taller than the Eiffel Tower, which was about 1,000. And then around which the visitors could be uh, guided with the aid of various mechanical devices. So the main fra framework uh, would contain four large suspended geometric shapes. Uh, and these shapes would rotate at different rates. At the base of the structure was a cube, which was designed as a venue for lectures or for conferences, uh, legislative meetings. And it would complete its uh, rotation in the span of one year. And then above the cube would be a smaller pyramid housing executive activities and its rotation would be once a month. And then further up, a cylinder, which was to house an information center, and issuing bullet bulletins, manifestos, and it would complete its rotation once a day. And at the very top, there would be a hemisphere for a dome, for radio equipment. Uh, well, clearly, it was meant to compete with the Eiffel Tower. As I said, the Eiffel Tower was at this point the greatest symbol of technological uh, progress in the world and Russia had now embarked on competing with the West and, uh, and beating them at it, as they said numerously. This was also never built because uh, Russia just didn't have materials to build it. Uh, however, there is copies, much, much smaller copies, one can find around Europe. And uh, this became Tatlin's most uh, famous contribution. When the small model was constructed, it was taken through St. Petersburg. At that time, the name of the city was changed to Leningrad after Vladimir Lenin. And here is this enormous procession that's uh, taking up uh, this construction as if it were an icon. And one can't help thinking about Ilya Repin that we had looked at earlier and the procession of the cross, except this is the new cross, so to speak. This is the cross of the future. It announces the secular religion that Russia now embraced. Still another uh, sculptor who, uh, who left Russia and uh, proceeded to, to do these sculptures without masks that we had seen. Picasso's guitar is one and uh, uh, Tatlin, Tatlin's constructions in the corner also are sculptures without uh, masks. He proceeded with the same idea of uh, substituting mass with planes. So instead of the surface, he now had uh, the space penetrating the sculpture and defining the sculpture. 
uh, and the sculpture created purely by intersecting areas. Back in Russia, propaganda became of greatest importance and a man by the name of Alexander Rochenka uh, achieved this uh, great mass production of inexpensive placards, billboards, that uh, had a very clear message for the uh, population, uh, the icons of the, uh, the new age, uh, that told them how to behave, where to go, what to worship. Last but not least, uh, also Russian, uh, a Russian Jew who came to America in his early teens uh, through the Ellis Island. His name is Mark Rothko, who will reach fame after the Second World War in the 50s, who will become part of uh, that abstract expressionism movement of which Pollock uh, was another star. His family arrived as immigrants from Russia. Uh, although he claimed to have adhered to no art movement, he obviously adhered to the abstract expressionism. That was all the rage uh, in the 1950s, and he created his canvases by turning them into the impression of paper uh, on which watercolors are allowed to roam free and to blend freely. And that's what uh, Mark Rothko's art is about. So thus, uh, Russia definitely entered the 20th century in many ways. It still followed the West behind what was now being built as the Iron Curtain. Uh, the, uh, original avant-garde art was uh, very quickly smothered and destroyed. So we saw uh, Russian art as it began uh, imported from Byzantium after the year 1000 when the country embraced um, uh, Christianity and most of the, uh, the artists were Byzantine artists. However, uh, Russia will acquire its own personality and uh, its own style even though with the uh, following centuries, that style very often will still be conveyed by foreign uh, artists and uh, architects. And that will be the case until uh, Peter the Great will open up Russia to the West. Uh, so in the 18th century already Western influences will come pouring into Russia and as we saw in the 19th century the dam was open and uh, uh, Russians proved themselves as creative as any other culture and produced extraordinary works of art, literature, poetry, science, uh, science as well. And uh, everything was accelerated because they had to make up for all the lost time since they, uh, since they missed the antiquity and they missed the Renaissance and they missed the uh, Middle Ages in between. All of that was missed, they had to make up for it. The emancipation of serfs in 1861 was a disaster. A disaster from the point of view that, yes, people were emancipated, thankfully, but they were given absolutely no means to support themselves, which 50 years later then spilt into the Russian Revolution that turned the, the old society upside down in, uh, in the hope of a greater future, the future that never came, but in that very short period, uh, from the revolution till this smothering of aspirations. Uh, interesting art was produced and brilliant ideas were experimented with. Well, this is the end of our semester and it was wonderful to have you and I thank you very much and have a brilliant summer. Goodbye and good luck.